Okay, I'm gonna have that green, that, that lady in green. She's so green. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I just wanted to, to, to ask you all an uh, opinion on these vote swap things that I'm seeing oh, on yeah. Facebook and stuff. I, I think, you know, our, our basic message is we, we really want to encourage people to vote for what they believe in, and that's how we can you know, get real change. But if people like that idea and say, you know, I really want to do it, then point them in the right direction. I think it's a matter of individual choice. I wouldn't encourage it, but tell people the info if it's useful to them. Does, would anybody, would, just a spot poll, would anybody do that or do you just not trust the rest of the electorate? Who would do it? You would do it. Oh, you've done it. What is okay. it? What is it? So you just, you basically find somebody on Twitter or on Facebook who will vote for the person, you find a marginal in which a green might win and you say, will you vote for the green and I'll vote for your marginal in the seat that I'm in. So it's kind of tactical voting but but, but kind of supercharged because you might actually get a green MP somewhere. But I mean, I, I think probably you, other people will be looking for a vote swap with you because Rupert might get in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, there's loads. Okay, stripey and then flat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a wild list. <laughs> I, firstly, I was just going to say I don't um, think that I'd use the vote swap system myself, but if you can't find someone particularly in a different constituency who you would want to vote swap with, there's like an official vote swap website now and you can sign up and agree to swap with someone in a constituency somewhere completely across the country you don't know. I don't know if you trust that system, but it, it's in place, which makes things kind of easier, I suppose. Um, but the question that I had for you is that um, in your manifesto, you had quite an ambitious housing policy, um, and I completely agree that social housing is such a pressing issue. Um, whether you can make the targets at 500,000 new homes, um, that, that's a different issue. It's not what I was going to ask. Um, what I was wondering is how you were going to align that with your policies of um, controlled growth and wildlife and area conservation. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, for those who don't know, our plan is over the course of the next parliament to build 500,000 homes for um, social rent, genuinely affordable rent. I have to say that in, the, in these parts because affordable housing has become a bit of a uh, nasty word, an often misused word. Um, that's something we step up gradually. If you look at the detail of the figures, we you know, have a relatively small number in the first year and are staffing it up. We've talked to the housing industry about what's possible and they think the figures that we've got in there are possible. Uh, and in terms of where they go, um, very much looking at brownfield sites, at you know, not green belt sites, you know, there might be some very, I wouldn't say 100% never on a greenfield site. There may be certain places where it's, you know, there's a sensible place and you know, sometimes what, what counts as, as green belt is actually you know, between the motorway and the railway line and you can, it's a sensible place to put some housing. Uh, but you know, one of the things to look at is the real imbalance in, in across Britain. The fact that there's so much pressure in the southeast and in this part of the eastern region, so much resources, so much money going here. And if we have more balanced regional development, then we can actually. You look at some northern cities that I go through on the train all the time, and there's huge brownfield sites in the centre of cities, you know, right near all the transport links and everything, where you can put a lot of very good housing, you know, in a very sensible place. So one of the reasons why it looks so difficult is that real imbalance. So you know, in terms of we're talking about 125,000 of those homes in London, which doesn't reflect necessarily the current level of demand, but it reflects the fact that if you rebalance the economy, then you can put it in places where it's actually a lot easier to do that. Can I ask a follow-up question? Because there is a line, isn't there, a kind of neo-Marxist line, that the problem with housing is not actually a shortage of housing, but the fact that people, when you use it for an investment vehicle, it becomes more expensive than anybody can afford. And that seems to me really, really plain. You know, you've got 20% of the bottom who can't afford anything, but you've also got 60% in the middle who can't afford, who can't really afford anything either. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, unless they're over 40, which thank God I am. Um, <laughs> what, I mean, you know, no, I know nobody wants to kind of march into battle saying they're going to bring back Marx, but at some point, don't we have to talk about the fact that, that, that use value and exchange value are an observable problem? 
Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily put it in those terminologies, partly because it wouldn't work very well on the six o'clock news, going back to where I was before. But what we do say is that we have to stop regarding homes as primarily financial assets and go back to thinking them as stable, secure, affordable places for people to live. So one of the ways, the prime way in which we fund those 500,000 new homes is by removing the mortgage rate relief on private landlords. At the moment, they get tax relief which is the sort of thing you usually give to people because they're doing good things. So for example, companies get tax relief on research and development investment mm -hmm. because it's assumed that that's a good thing for them to be spending money on. Um, but we're giving that to private landlords, as well as of course we're giving them massive amounts of housing benefit. And so yeah. we're taking away that benefit for private landlords. Mm -hmm. What we're also doing of course is also trying to put very strong restrictions on private landlords, so giving private tenants five year security of tenure putting caps on rent rises so they can't go up more than the rate of inflation each okay. year. So we're actually really trying to redress the balance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, we, under Right to Buy, we've lost 1.5 million homes. We're trying to replace a third of that, and we are also want to end Right to Buy. Yeah. It's the kind of absolute reverse of the Tories <coughs> policy, which we, we talk about policies that fall apart five minutes after oh they announced the Tory it policy on Right to Buy. It was, it was a good example. Um, uh, we've got a real situation where we need to shift this around and go back to thinking of homes as places for people to live. And it's also one of the other things I often talk about with, with housing is this is a little known fact and it's partly a factor of demographic, demographic change, but it's also there are now more bedrooms per person in Britain than there has ever been before. Mm -hmm. And that's partly a measure of inequality. Part of North London that I live in, or at least near the part of North London where I live in, uh, the big housing issue is people who are building double basements because they need in their house a private cinema and a private gym. Yeah. And so they've got to have that double basement in this enormous house that already has quite a lot of bedrooms and probably two people in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I want to catch that question there. You, yeah, you. Yeah. Thirty percent of housing in new development in um, the southern fringe is actually being bought as an investment, and quite a large proportion of it you get in. Yeah, yeah, no, I, mean, I, I think that's it, yeah. 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 I mean, you can't only talk about housing, though, so we have to take that question in. That. That's a very good point, but you can't reply to it. <laughs> <laughs> that, so there's a, there's a guy in, like, the eighth row. Right? Yeah, you. No, no, you, definitely you, yeah. So, um, so I am going to vote green before I uh, ask you quite a difficult question. It was related to the last one, actually, about housing and, and the green belt. Um, the Green Belt was, was conceived in the 1940s when we had a different understanding of ecology and different, you know, social and economic conditions. The Green Belt is actually agricultural land in many cases and you can find more biodiversity in urban areas where you do have a, a mix of um, parks and multifunctional spaces and so on and I'm sure that that's been discussed. Um, so I'm just wondering how, how, how hard line are you on this issue? You know, you want to build 500,000 new homes but look at Cambridge, I mean, we're struggling here to accommodate the rapid population growth. It partially also being a product of it being in the southeast. Um, so within the, the, the sort of green philosophy, what, what is the tension there between valuing nature in this way of saying, oh, don't build on the green, it's nature, and then saying, actually, let's be more critical and, and think of the different ways in which nature exists. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to answer that question. I'm also going to warn Zoe that I just got a five minute warning because yeah, I have to go. go. I so, 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 I'm going to have the case with Rupert. Yeah, you, yeah. Huh? If there's any pressing <laughs> question Zoe wants to ask me, she's going to have a final window after I've answered your question. Which is the reasons for protecting the green belt are not only or even primarily the environmental ones in the sort of protecting nature sense. What we don't need are big, big sprawling cities in which inevitably end up dependent on car transport or where you have to spend an absolute fortune with public transport for big sprawling cities. And what gets built on Green Belt is almost invariably private developments that are expensive homes that you're going to need two incomes to pay the mortgage for. You're going to need two cars because there's no way you get it, there's no public transport to be able to service those incomes. And so it's just utterly the wrong type of development. Now, a lot of that agricultural land on the fringes of cities is often quite poor, ecologically speaking. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we very much need to do, and I've sort of done a lot of work and done a lot of visits around this, is we really need to restore the ring of market gardens around towns and cities. And I've seen some really interesting examples. There's Riverside Market Gardens in Cardiff, for example, 
where they're really trying to, to model, and they've got some money from the Welsh Government on this, to model how do you set up a really good economic unit on 10 or 20 acres that's really biodiverse, that's growing lots of different things, that's perhaps using some permaculture principles, that's really, you know, we, we need to be growing food on that land and we need to be growing different kind of food to what we're generally doing now. So we really need to make sure our cities and towns don't sprawl out and we need to make sure that we're really restoring the food production around them and that's what we need the land for rather than necessarily specifically environmental things. Well, of course one of the other things we need the land to um, for and let's not you know play this down. People being able to go for a walk, walk their dogs, have green space around them, have green lungs around them is really important too. And I think of um, I visited Belper in mid Derbyshire and the big issue there was a green belt development that basically just would have joined up three villages together and people would have lost their open green space that was so important to all of those areas as a social space as well as an environmental space. I think you've got to look at all of those things. Okay. Um, so you have to go right now, right? So, okay, finally then, what, you know, it's three weeks till, vote, till polling day. What message comes, what, what message strikes you as the kind of strongest thing to say to gather support, either to overcome inertia or to get straggling Labour voters or, you know, what, what do you think people should be saying? Well, I would really say to people, that simple message of vote for what you believe in. You know, we've got the kind of politics we have now because people have been voting tactically mm. for decades. Mm -hmm. um, what you've seen is particularly the two largest parties have got almost indistinguishably close together because they're chasing the swing voters and the swing seats. I actually saw on Channel 4 News last night Michael Gove saying this very thing, we just need to win 11,000 votes in certain key seats mm. and that'll give us a majority in government. Mm. And you know, with Lincoln Crosby and the whole Tory machine, they're focused on that. And Labour is focused on probably not a very much larger group of people. Mm. And that's assuming that all of the core vote behind them, you know, core Labour in particular, all of that stuff about fiscal rectitude, they're assuming that lots of people will just stay with them no matter what. And if we're gonna change politics, yeah. voting the same normal old tactical way, holding your nose and voting for the lesser of two evils, isn't gonna change politics. We want something different. We've yeah. got to behave differently. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you.